Hi, welcome back to Box of Delights. Let's continue with our Kingmaker playthrough. It's the blue player's turn. I'll start by drawing an event. And there's a plague in York and Kingston. Oh my gosh, this has really messed things up. So it is unusual. Games can go a funny way. Richard of York is down, which means heir to the Yorkish throne is now his son, Edward. Edward is over here in Harlech. Now, you may find it easier to place the royal pieces with the noble that's controlling them. Just remember, if you do it this way, that when they move, they don't necessarily move with that noble. So if you need to drop them off, drop them off. So Edward is with Talbot. George of the Yorkish line is with Herbert. I think that's it. All right, so Plague is done. York and Kingston as well. Now, who's in Kingston? Nobody's in Kingston. Okay, Plague resolved. Now, Blue. So Stanley's up here on the Isle of Douglas. He's kind of a little bit isolated. He needs a ship. So we'll need to bring this ship from London. So out of London, they have to pass down the Thames. So actually, this is one movement here, two we can't go up north around Scotland, so three, four, five will do it. Let's imagine then that Ruse wants to join up with that ship somehow. So Ruse is up here in Helmsley. Let's say they want to head to Preston. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's say they just do something like that. Actually, I think they could get all the way to Preston. One, one, two, three, four, five, yeah. But let's say they miscalculate and they've stopped out in the open field, one space short. And that leaves Cromwell. Now Cromwell's got quite a big force. Um, he's got a hundred extra troops in Devon and Cornwall, but he's not in he's over here in Tattersall. But Edward of Lancaster is right here in Coventry. We're heading over there. One, two, three. Yep, yeah, I'm going in and taking Edward of Lancaster. Okay, so Cromwell has Edward. Margaret's still heir to the Lancastrian throne, and then Edward is next. Margaret is here in Fotheringhay, but Cromwell didn't have quite enough forces. Almost 10, 60, 70, 80, 120, yeah. And a royal castle gives a garrison of 200, so not enough to go and get Margaret, but enough to go and take Edward in Coventry. Let's finish up blue player's turn. So they, they've moved everyone. They're gonna grab a, a crown card. Okay, an office, Constable of Dover with 50 troops, interesting. So they could give that to Stanley or Ruse. So that's, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's cool. They're not Stanley, Stanley's not titled. So Ruse, who's heading over here. But I'll keep hold of it for now. Orange player next. Let's see what they get. They've got a French raid. Now this says the Admiral of England to arrive with two ships, and the Admiral of England is not in play. And then the Warden of St. Ports to arrive with two ships. Well, we know the Warden of St. Ports is his Rye with two ships, and that is Holland. And Holland is here. So the so Holland has to come all the way down to Rye, the port of Rye. Okay, no big deal, but it does leave Holland a little bit vulnerable. I'm just putting that there to remind us that Holland is controlled by the green player. So Rye is in this unfortified town of Rye, so there's no garrison here. This is the equivalent to being out in the field, okay, these little, these little towns here. So no garrison, Holland only has the troops that he's brought with him, 100 troops. But he's brought here by this event to defend against a French raid. Now Orange player gets to move his nobles and he sees a little bit of an opportunity here. Grey and Percy are up in Carlisle. They're stacked together here. And they can do a quick move. Now they did have their eye on Massam. Massam 
is in a castle with a garrison of 100, plus the troops he's got with him, which happen to be about 90, I think, 190. But now, Ruse here has made himself a bit of a target, so they can move as a stack, so moving together five spaces. One, two, three, four, five. We're out in the field here. We've also got the town of Lancaster just off to the northwest. So that's Percy and Grey moved. Herbert and Courtney over here. Let's say Courtney wants to head over to London. London's already been hit by the plague and they've got this constable card ready to give out. So maybe Courtney could move up there. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's go up to Bath. Courtney's pretty weak at the moment, with only 30 troops. We could give them this as well, make it 80, but let's wait. Although, maybe we could give it to them now. 200 troops within two squares of London, so we're not quite... One, two, yeah, we couldn't quite make it. But it's a threat. So let's give that to Courtney. It's the Earl of Devonshire. So yeah, that looks a little bit stronger now. That just leaves Herbert, who hasn't moved. Now we know Herbert's quite strong. He's got 100 troops plus 200 when in Wales. So he's got 300 troops and he's currently got uh, George. Now up in Harlech here, this is a royal castle with a garrison of 200. We haven't got quite enough to get to Harlech. Talbot's up here. So this is a royal castle with a garrison of 200, but Talbot has got an additional 80, 110, yeah. And plus 100 within three squares of Conway. So Talbot's actually really strong up here. So you've got three, 400 odd in Harlech. So we're not gonna get at Edward just yet. We do have the ship of Berwick, which could now move up into London. One, two, three, in preparation for Courtney coming around. I think it'll do that. I think Herbert with his, what, 50, 90, 10, yeah, 100, 300 troops is going to head down here to Swansea. Um, one, two, three, four, yeah, four, Swansea. So we could go into the town or the castle, but we're going to try and go into the town. So we're out in the field right now, because this is obviously a neutral town. We have to siege it. So end of the turn, we do battles first. Now these two enemies here, blue and orange, they could exist in the field together without conflict, but orange can choose and say, I'm going to battle. So between them, so this is Percy and Gray, remember, they've got 20, 40, 140 troops, okay, 140. Their target is Ruse, who's got just 60. 140 to 60. We're not quite 3 to 1. 3 to 1 would be 180 to 60. Now there is, in the second printing, a table of odds. Down the left-hand side is the defender's force. So that's the 60. Orange player has 140. So you can see a success will come at... Anything from 5 to 4 odds up to 2 to 1 odds, 80, 90, 120 respectively, needed in the attacking force. The only time this attack will fail is if we pull 3 to 1 odds or 4 to 1 odds. Or we pull a card that says bad weather delays attack, in which case they'll just sit there in the open and we'll wait. Now remember there's also a risk that some nobles will be killed. Alright, let's see what we pull. <laughs> Free move, that goes to orange. And then we've got a four to one victory. Oh dear. <laughs> That's just about the worst draw they could do. It's going to be a fail. Right, before we resolve that, we'll come back to that. Let's just draw again. What was next? Okay, two to one victory. That would have been better. So 
two to one victory for the orange player with pole and scroop if they were involved in the battle becoming casualties of the battle they're not so we ignore that bit but there is a victory what does a victory look like he has two choices he can either send the defeated noble packing back to the faction's home castle uh, which he doesn't want to do i mean it doesn't make much sense unless he can extract some kind of bribe from the blue player so back to Balfour or Helmsley. Or he can defeat and kill Roos, which is what he's going to choose to do. So Roos would be killed. That would go back on the bottom of the crown deck. And then any titles or offices would be placed face down in the chancery. Any other cards, like towns or bishops, ships or mercenaries he can take and distribute among his own nobles. He can't hold on to them, must distribute them amongst his nobles. Not just the ones that are involved in the battles. So these have become kind of captured, distribute them. And of course, any royal pieces that were there, he would now control. So that's what a victory looks like. Pretty good. The spoils of war are good. And of course, these cards Offices and titles in the Chancery will be there for distribution when we come to the next Parliament. Now, unfortunately, that was not what happened, <laughs> OK? What happened was this one. This says 4-1 to one victory is a loss, and the following nobles are killed, Grey, Percy and Herbert. Now, if nobles are killed, do the calculation for victory first and then take casualties. All right? So you could still win the battle even if your nobles were killed. Failure has no consequences, really. The forces just remain in battle where they are. It's an indecisive battle. And then next turn, you can try again. But casualties are then taken. So we've got Grey, Percy and Herbert. That's really bad for Orange. Now, Herbert's not in the battle, but both Grey and Percy are. So. Grey and Percy are both casualties. So the nobles go. Any titles and offices, there weren't any as it goes, will go to the chancery. Face down. All other cards are shuffled up and placed on the bottom of the crown deck. Okay. Done. So it ended up being a really bad play for the orange player. Now it must be noted, blue did have a card, so they could have pulled this out and assigned it to Ruse as kind of a, a, get, a kind of a gotcha at the last minute. So rather than 60, they could have boosted themselves up to 110. Now it's not specifically cited in the aerial first or second printing rules how you do this. Instead, it just says you may declare these cards at any time, but Alan Paul in Kingmaker 2nd, the new release, has made it clear that you actually do a little bit of a back and forth. So say to the defender, do you wish? So once you've declared numbers, before resolving, you say, do you want to add any crown cards to the defender? They say yes or no. And then you go to the attacker, um, yes or no. If they say no, you stop. Otherwise, you go back to the, if they say yes and add one, you can go back to the defender. So you go back and forth and continue adding until everyone says no and passes, if you like. And only then, once everyone's passed, finished adding crown cards, do you resolve the battle. Right? And I suggest you use that rule rather than the kind of free for all as, no, am I going to add a crown card? No, maybe I won't, maybe I will. Right? Do it that way, nice and controlled. OK, but Blue Player decided not to anyway. They quite fancied their odds. And you do this before drawing an event card. Herbert now can choose to siege All right so the battle's resolved we move to sieges it's up to herbert but let's say they choose to move and attack swansea swansea's a town with a garrison of 200 herbert has a force of 300 okay 200 troops in wales they draw a card we're looking for anything other than bad weather delays we know it was a victory Pole and Scroop are casualties. They're not involved. It was just Herbert. Herbert successfully captures Swansea, now controls the town of Swansea. Now, if the town of Swansea card 
if another player held the Swansea Town card, they don't have to hand it over. What that means is that control of Swansea is with Herbert, it's with the orange player, but it's not specifically controlled by one of his nobles, but by the orange player's faction. That's possibly the one rule that I don't think makes a lot of sense. If you control the town, control the town, you know. Um, I guess the only reason for having a town card that you for a town you don't control is that it, if it's hidden in your faction, it makes you look a little bit stronger than you really are. But it is one rule that's changed up. So in the latest versions, in fact, in the Avalon Hill versions, as soon as you capture a town, you go and grab that card if it's possessed by somebody else. Right, to... To take control of the town, you take control of the card. All right, that, um, that finishes up, I think, for Orange Player. So they're going to draw a crown card. They've got Treasure of England. And we're going to move to the Green Player. So let's draw the next event. And it's a writ that summons to Parliament, of which they've got a couple. Now, rather than keep playing, what I want to do now is kind of roll things forward a little bit and we need to show off some of those other rules so we've seen sieges we've seen battles we need to look at the coronation and parliament so let's start with the coronation so green player has got edward the yorkist and with richard of york killed by plague edward is now successor to the throne here he is, here with Talbot. And Talbot happens to be Bishop of Durham. We've got a ship as well, but it's going to take a few little turns because Talbot's up here in Harlech, and we need a few things. Now we can't use the Bristol. The Bristol's only got a capacity for 100 troops, and Talbot currently has 50, it's 110. 110 troops, so the ship's out. Aside from that, there's a sea border here, so we can't cross over. But if the Bristol were around here, we'd need another ship. We've got the Trinity and the George, now they're actually 150, so let's assume we brought, say, the George around here on a move. That's 150. That's Holland that controls that, so still green player. Then we could move over to where is this so this is actually a nice port here now we'd have to end our turn here because we can't embark on the ship and then move so we'd have to end our turn draw another card right, we've drawn a bishop that's handy now next turn they can board and set sail we need this bishop card because Talbot is bishop of Durham we need two bishops to do a coronation or one archbishop so with Bishop and Durham and Bishop of Lincoln, so let's say we drew that, we've assigned it now to Talbot. So Talbot is now Bishop of Durham and Bishop of Lincoln. It could be a different noble. So we could give this Bishop of Durham to Holland, for example. But that means then bringing that noble together with the other with Talbot. Right. So bishoprics could be held by one or more nobles. So what's important is that you need two bishops in a single town. Now, it says here on the key, a white cross indicates a cathedral, the only place where a coronation can take place. So we could take this ship and sail to a cathedral town, like Exeter down here. Chester was close by, but that's controlled by the orange player. So unless we've got an allegiance with them and got their permission, we can't enter that town. But let's say we sail around to Exeter. Now, again, that's a movement. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven. It's actually going to take quite a few turns, a couple of turns to get there. But once the ship has finished sailing, the passengers can't immediately disembark. They have to wait till the next turn because you can't move twice on the same turn. Right? Then they can move in to Exeter. Now, obviously, they're going to need a little bit of help somewhere because Exeter is not controlled. We, we haven't got the freedom of the city. We have to assault that. Remember, towns have a garrison of 200. Talbot's only got 110. So they'll need a few other a few other troops. But let's assume they manage to assault 
uh, siege Exeter, take control of Exeter. Right, Exeter is a cathedral town, okay? So we can enter Exeter, end our turn, remember we're drawing events, doing all the movement, then calling Parliament if we wish. The final piece before end of turn is coronation. Do we wish, do we have all the requirements to call a coronation? So we do. Talbot is here. They're at a cathedral fortification. It has a white cross. They have two bishops or one archbishop. They have a royal piece, control of a royal piece in the town who is next in line to the crown for his house, House York. All we need to do once those requirements are fulfilled is declare a coronation. Royal power has been assumed by Edward of March. In the aerial version, there's nothing to indicate that Edward is king. You just have to know that Edward is king. So we've got a sole king now. Remember, House Lancaster could also be crowning Margaret of Anjou and making her queen the House Lancaster. So England could have two monarchs. All right, so that's how you conduct a coronation. Edward is now king. Now, what about Parliament? Now that there's a sole king controlled by the Green player, the Green player can summon Parliament. If there were two crowned kings, two monarchs, then they couldn't. Right? It would it could only be summoned by the Chancellor, remember? And they'd need a Parliament card. Maybe summoned by the Chancellor. Right. But we don't have a Chancellor. We do have a sole king now. Edward has been crowned. So, end of the turn, you've moved all your pieces, you've done all your battles, you've done all your sieges before a coronation. So you can't crown a king and then call parliament with that king on the same turn because the sequence isn't right. You've got to do parliament first, then coronation. So green player on a subsequent turn, with control of the sole king, can summon parliament. Now, a single faction can't call parliament on their own. They can't have a parliament where they're the only player seated. They need nobles from another faction. And this is where they use their writ cards. They've got two writ cards. They need at least one. They can use as many as they wish. And with that writ, they will summon another noble to Parliament. Now, you can only summon Parliament at the town or city where the king is located. Right? It doesn't have to be a, a city. It doesn't have to be a cathedral town. Right? It could be anywhere that you control. So it could be that we're up in Northampton with the king all right you can even summon parliament an unfortified town remember an unfortified town doesn't have to be controlled by anybody so for example uh, we could come down to st albans maybe we've wandered about we're stuck in st albans it's a town right nobody controls towns you can call parliament there if you wish if that's where the king is it's not it's not a great place to be because you're vulnerable there's no garrison in an unfortified town so more than likely it will be at a fortified town but just so you know you could potentially do that if you wished All right but let's look at the more interesting situation of calling parliament at a fortified town that we control northampton for example Parliament's going to be held here. What we're going to do now with our writ is we're going to summon another faction's noble to Northampton. With each writ that they use, they can summon an unfriendly noble. So we might summon, say, Courtney with one writ and then, say, Stanley from Douglas with the other writ. Now, in the updated rules, people like Stanley over on the island of Douglas cannot involuntarily attend Parliament because they're stuck out on an island. They have to be over on the mainland. Likewise, besieged nobles can't involuntarily be summoned via a writ to Parliament. Okay, So nobles that are stuck in a location can't be summoned. Likewise, you can't have Parliament in a location, in a fortification that's currently under siege. Now, the Parliament's actually going to happen in the area. Remember, this is Northampton's controlled by Green. So all these nobles that are attending are going to come out of the town and they're actually, I don't know, they're in the area, they're in the field of this region. And we'll look at the updated version when we, when we get there. But um, if you do have, say, Stanley out on the Isle of Douglas, but 
the blue player happens to have ships or people can loan ships to bring Stanley over, then I'm afraid they're they're forced to attend. But um, in the aerial version, the version we're playing, anyone who's summoned has to attend. Once writs have been served, um, they get discarded. These go back on the bottom of the event deck, by the way. So that event deck will cycle around if necessary. Once writs have been summoned, people can voluntarily move their nobles into Parliament if they wish. And they don't have to. Likewise, green players calling Parliament, they could have their other nobles come over and join in the fun and games. So all these nobles attending Parliament in the area of Northampton. It can't be an empty area like this. It has to be an area that contains, I'd say, a town or a friendly fortification. Now then, so there we go. We've got everyone up in Parliament. Now, what's the point? The point is that we've got cards in the Chancery. Remember, killed nobles, defeated nobles will be losing their offices and titles. So there might be a bunch of cards in the Chancery ready for distribution. We won't call Stanley over from Douglas. So we've served our two writs. We've got these guys. We've, I mean, you're using it to pull these nobles out of their fortifications. Because once Parliament's over, these nobles are going to be stuck in the field here. They're going to have to move away as normal on their turn. So once all the nobles are there, we count them up. We've got four nobles here. The king will draw four cards from the chancery. Okay. And these cards will be distributed amongst the factions of those nobles attending Parliament. What's important is, and you've got to remember this, and this is going to be important to, you know, when you're serving your writ and calling nobles in, you don't really want to benefit other factions. And remember the rule, you can only have, nobles can only have one title and one office, and offices can only go to titled nobles. But if we had nobles without office, without title, then now's the time to start distributing them. Okay, so we could have given this to a new noble. I mean, the thing is, when you're pulling cards from the crown deck, you are potentially creating new nobles. And when you play this card, so maybe we had Audley and we pulled this, it was sitting in our hand. Well, we're going to declare him now and say, Audley, you're up. Add him to your faction. He goes off to his castle and now allocate him a title and an office. What's important is, though, that these offices and titles are not limited to just the nobles who are attending Parliament. They could be any nobles, okay? You can send these and award these offices and titles to any nobles. And once Parliament's been called and concluded, any factions attending Parliament, so here, orange, blue and green, they can all exchange cards between their nobles. Normally you can't do this, you can't exchange cards between nobles, but once Parliament's called, now's your opportunity. If you've, if you've attended you can start trading between your nobles. Any cards that couldn't be distributed, they're going to go back on the bottom of the crown deck, not back to the chancery. Okay, But calling Parliament has enriched our own faction. We've repositioned enemy factions. We've shaken them up a little bit, pulled them into the field. We're in a stronger position because we're in a region with our fortified location. But of course, these guys could now combine forces in some way, potentially mount a siege, whatever. So there's swings and roundabouts, as is always the case in Keymaker. I've kind of given you enough of the rules now that you can go off and play the game. Oh, I should say one rule that's been introduced into the new version is the King's Peace. So once Parliament's concluded, there's no battles here for a whole round okay, until we get back to the turn of the player who called Parliament, right? So King's Peace gives you an opportunity to kind of run off, but not in the arrow version, not in our version. It's kind of Parliament concludes free for all, but feel free to adapt that rule if you wish. Right, alliances. So tradables, remember right back at the beginning of this series, I said how this is a negotiation game. Well, it is. Now, nobles are not tradable. You can't pass noble from faction to faction. But remember, you've got passage through roads. Royal pieces can be traded. Offices can be traded, titles 
cannot be traded, but offices, all those other cards, bishoprics, control of towns, all these things can be traded. You can loan ships. Okay, So yeah, come and use my ship for passage if you wish. So make those deals with each other. All these things are tradables that you can use as leverage to make other players do what you want and, and work together. Now, the other important thing is that individual nobles can, we already know they can stack, but if you form an alliance with another faction, your nobles can stack. So we could potentially have some orange nobles stacked with some blue nobles in, as an alliance. On the next turn after this alliance is formed, either on a blue player or orange player, these nobles can then move together. Whichever noble is on top here, so that if they moved on the blue player's turn, they couldn't then move again on the orange player's turn. So one of the nobles has to be kind of like the lead, if you like, but they can operate and move as a single stack, as if they were under control of a single noble. That's an alliance. And that alliance can be broken by either player at any time. But obviously, if blue player say moves them, then the alliance is broken. Orange couldn't then move on their turn, right? Because they've already moved as part of blue, so they'd have to wait around and then they can move again. Okay, that's alliances. And that's how you kind of eke out the margins you need to win at this game. Remember, if you manage to control more than one royal piece, crown one, eliminate the others, you can sacrifice a royal piece you can control at any time okay it's up to you when have the remaining crowned royal piece with no rivals yorkist or lancastrian and you are victorious there is a shorter game where you can count victory points i'm not going to go into that today but check out the rule book so if you want to you can you can set a time limit on the game and then figure out who's got the most points okay so for example Add up the total number of troops that you've got in your hand. Uh, add 100 for each royal piece you control. If crowned, another 100 points, and so on and so on. Okay, so there's different um, points allocations. So check out the back of the rule book. But there you go, that's Kingmaker. I hope you've enjoyed this overview of the rules, and I hope this helps you get them and going with the aerial game. Like I said, I've managed, hopefully, highlighted the rule differences for Avalon Hill and Gibsons, so you've got enough to arm yourselves as players of this classic game.